Welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for joining uh, this conversation about the IRT's production of T.J. Young's play, Number Six. My name is Julian Harrell, and I am a board member at the IRT and also a member of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee at the IRT. Uh, and so it's a pleasure um, to be here virtually with everyone and host this panel this evening. Um, there are a couple housekeeping and Zoom etiquette items uh, that we'll cover. We will be monitoring questions in the chat, and there will also be an opportunity to take questions at the end of the Zoom uh, from our Zoom participants, as well as folks who have joined us on social media. Um, but before we go any further, uh, we'd also like to take a moment um, and, and have a land acknowledgement. Um, while we gather virtually today, um, it's important to acknowledge that the land where we live and work is critical to growing mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage. Specifically, we want to acknowledge that what we now call Indiana is on the ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples, including the Miami, Piankasha, Wea, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Delaware, and Shawnee. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. The Indiana Theater, where the IRT now produces plays, was originally built as a segregated movie house in the 1920s. And while there are many of us who don't recall or remember this time, uh, this history must be acknowledged as we work to create a more inclusive, welcoming theater. With that, we will move to the, the actual panel discussion um, this evening. And uh, I am pleased to have a couple of my colleagues here with me. Um, Ashley Talley is legal counsel at Anthem. Um, we, and we thank her for being here this evening. Um, Ryan Danley is a compliance and ethics coordinator um, for the North American region for American Honda Motor Company. Also thanks to, to Ryan. And we anticipate, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, that, um, that Ahmed Young, Chief of Staff and General Counsel for Indianapolis Public Schools, will be joining us momentarily. Um, before we uh, hear, hear for our, uh, some thoughts from our panelists and, and, um, and also kind of engage the participants, um, I thought it might be helpful to just provide a little bit of context uh, and I guess kind of my uh, take on the play number six. So uh, from my vantage point, um, the play is titled number six as a reference to Felicia's theory that there's been five extinction level events in the history of the planet and that humans are in the process, humanity is in the process of bringing about our own extinction, um, the, which would be the sixth extinction, hence um, number six. It's also a play that develops in six scenes and each scene develops incrementally and helps highlight what I view as a hyper specific piece of this sixth ex extinction in progress. Um, that being the eradication and extinction of, of black people, specifically the black male. Um, there's also a harsh spotlight on the nature and the, uh, you know, engaging in conversation and communication itself. There, there are several moments in the play that, that I'm sure um, everyone has, has, um, has viewed that where the characters are essentially talking past each other, right? They're, they're caught up in arguing their own position. Uh, and, and because they're so focused on making sure that their point is heard, they fail to identify common ground or build consensus or, or figure out a way to, to identify a path forward. And this type of talking past each other uh, threatens to have a perpetual repetition of history in a way that is, that is destructive. Um, and so that, that's just kind of my personal uh, reaction and, and, and framing of, of the play. But I, I think we might start with just kind of an open dialogue um, before we get into specific questions. You know, maybe we'll start with with Ashley and just um, 
you, kind of your response, uh, any key topics that that you'd like to raise, um, you know, in, in response to to what I've shared. Uh, and just kind of a, uh, and, and even before you do that, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and then give a, a general reaction to the play. Thank you, Julian, for the introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Ashley Talley. I'm legal counsel at Anthem here in the Indianapolis area. And I work primarily with healthcare and healthcare insurance um, issues and compliance. Um, over the last year, I have found myself to be a stay at home working mom and dealing with e-learning. And so that has been um, different, I guess is the best thing I can say, um, but also over the backdrop of many social justice issues, racial issues that we've seen over the last year, whether it be from George Floyd or the complete massacre down in Atlanta of um, some Asian Americans um, here. And so this play is, is, is timing. Um, and I think that it produces or is thought invoking on so many different levels. And I'll, I'll piggyback off what you said as it relates to um, the conversations. I think just this last year of all of our lives, we have opened up many different conversations, whether it be with your intimate group of friends. Um, I've seen it with various diversity and inclusion efforts for companies. Um, now we see the, the RRT having phenomenal plays like this one that helps us get dialogue started because um, as you mentioned, the characters find themselves talking over each other. And I thought that there was an interesting point where the mother um, says to the officer, you know, when you, when you speak, they hear you. And I think that what what made me think about when I, when I heard that, I, I automatically thought of Dr. King and the quote that we've all seen so many times, probably in the last year, especially with memes and, and, and that type of thing, where he says, um, a riot is the language of the unheard. And we see this play happening above a riot, right? Where they're in their apartment um, and there's people that are angry and frustrated and it asks us the question, are we listening to each other? Are we understanding whose voices are truly heard? And are they heard in the way that we want them to be heard? Um, and so that was really kind of what I looked for in the play was understanding perspectives. And you had four of them um, in this play. And so I hope that we dig into that because I think that is where a lot of the disconnect comes from that we all experience is that we're not listening to each other. We're not hearing each other or we're only hearing one side. And so that's kind of how I looked at this play and you know, how it touched me just emotionally and, and thought provoking. No, that's, that's powerful. And um, you know, thank you for, appreciate you sharing that. And I, and I, and you know, I am looking forward to in the next, uh, several moments uh, to definitely explore a number of those topics. Um, it's it's like you you might you might be a bit of a mind reader because you you actually pulled you know one of the quotes directly out of the play um, that that we are going to discuss a little bit later. Um, so that's that's uh, that's excellent um, you know timing and and fortuity. Um, so so thank you again. Um, Ryan, let's let's move let's move to you and, and kind of similar uh, similar thing. Just give us a, a brief introduction and, and kind of your initial thoughts, uh, reactions, etc. On the play. Sure. Thank you, Julian. Uh, my name is Ryan Danley. Uh, I currently work for American Honda and have worked in uh, various HR capacities for my career. And so uh, dealing with people is always interesting, and it's a passion of mine. Um, and so I think for that reason, uh, one thing that really stood out to me in the play was this concept of justice and who thought what was right versus wrong. And you saw it on so many different levels um, because we all have different context. So you have everything from Felix going, going to getting food and, you know, he had to feed his family. He thought that uh, that was important. They needed to eat. And so, um, you had the police officer who stopped him and thought he was doing the right thing because he thought Felix was breaking in. 
Uh, you had the mother who held back uh, Felicia's letter because she thought she was doing the right thing. Uh, and I mean, even the riots themselves, right? You know, some people thought that that was the right thing to do. And I always find it interesting what people feel is right because it's so dependent on our perspective, like Ashley alluded to, and, you know, on that, that greater context. So that really stood out to me. And then naturally just, uh, you know, being a black man, uh, the interplay with the officer and Felix and, you know, just the fact that, you know, he judged uh, Felix so harshly, just, you know, they didn't get into it, but they had that, you know, pretty strong scene where they were in the laundromat going back and forth. And he's like, why did you stop me? Why did you think I was suspicious? And he's like, oh, don't go there, you know? And so um, I, I think it, it stood out to me, um, you know, how interesting that interplay was. And also, you know, just the different conversations that they were having, like you said, talking past each other. So um, I found those things quite interesting. Appreciate that. Um, that, that as well, Ryan. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I think uh, just hitting, I mean, there's, there's so much to unpack in this play, um, even in early conversations um, that we were kind of having internally um, at the IRT, you know, one of, one of my, the early thoughts that I shared was just, you know, we could, we could talk about, you know, one of these things for extended periods of time. And so, you know, um, it's, there's, there's so much to unpack, but I think that we are hitting on um, some particularly timely um, issues right now um, that, that will, that we will kind of explore further. And so, you know, from a, from a high level, and we've kind of already hit on a few of these things already, but, you know, Ashley said that, that it's timely and, 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 and Ryan sort of alluded to that as well. Um, and so it's kind of important to think about why is this an important story to tell and, and why is it an important story to tell now? Um, one of the things that I, that I probably could have mentioned earlier is that this play, you know, uh, is actually a reimagining um, of a shooting uh, um, that happened in Cincinnati, Ohio, back in 2001, um, where, where the police uh, shot and killed a 19-year-old uh, black man, uh, Timothy Dwayne Thomas Jr. And the, the playwright um, was, a, was originally going to, to write a play um, about uh, Ferguson, when that happened, but but he he wanted to create um, a piece of, of of art that explored the dynamics in Ferguson without sort of doing what you know so many other people were doing at the time, and so he he referenced um, what happened in Cincinnati back in two thousand one as the you know as the catalyst for for creating this this play. And so, you know, the, one of the things that I think we, we, we should spend a little bit of time thinking about and, and discussing this evening is, you know, so 2001 is, is 20 years ago. Right. And, and we know that in 2001, there were things that happened 20 years before that. And, you know, all, all the way back in, you know, to, to the, you know, 1400s or, or, or so, uh, since atrocities have been committed on, on, uh, people of color, you know, in, in this part of the world and, and beyond. And so why is it that, you know, 20 years from, from the time that this incident happened, are we still having these conversations, right? Will we be having these conversations 20 years from now? Uh, if so, what is it, what will the nature of those conversations be? Um, and so it's important, it's an important story to tell um, because I think ultimately, you know, one of the things that the playwright is trying to accomplish is creating a conversation and a discussion um, to say, you know, wh like, why is this still happening? Why is history repeating itself? Why are we still talking past each other? Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it, for me, it's not something that I want to stop talking about, right? I don't, I don't think it's something that we ever stop talking about, I think that I would like to change the dynamic uh, and the context in which we are having these discussions, right? So that perhaps one day the conversation moves to, you know, we never want to go back there again versus 
you know, shaking my head, this has happened again, right? And and today, as we, you know, as we sit here, uh, the the context is, oh my goodness, you know, this this has happened again. So, with with that said, um, I, I think we, I do think we can move into some of the some of the prepared questions um, uh, that 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 I think are super important to to highlight this evening. Um, because again, one of the things that we'd like to, to, to get to is how, how to have certain conversations. Um, how do within those conversations, how to make sure that we are properly contextualizing and understanding experience to the extent that we can. And then, you know, as, as attorneys and, and ethics professionals, what about advocacy and policy making? Um, because, you know, conversation in and of itself isn't enough. It's the conversation and, and discussion and perspective is just the beginning. But as as civil engineers, as problem solvers, as as folks who understand, you know, change making, how do we move beyond the conversation? So, um, you know, I started with Ashley last time. Maybe I'll maybe I'll. But I, I and actually I think I'm going to start with you again, Ashley, because you, like I said, you kind of pulled the the quote right out of the play. Um, you know, obviously last summer, Indianapolis, like so many other cities across the country, was a stage for various reactions to racially motivated violence. Um, and, and people have various opinions, you know, ab about that. But, but we in Indianapolis saw those things unfold, and, and, and many of us participated even in um, various forms of protests in response to that violence. And Ashley, as you had mentioned just a few moments ago, and in the play, Ella says, sometimes you got to shake the walls if you want to get heard, and we ain't been heard yet. From your experience, um, Ashley, what is the essence? What is your interpretation of the essence of what Ella is saying? And, and then what is, quote, shaking the walls to you? What, what does that mean to you? Okay, so I was able to get off mute. I think what Ella, the mom in the play was saying was that, you know, some people view the riots as a horrible response to racial inequality or social injustice. And, you know, why would you go into your own community and tear it apart? Why would you burn things? Why would you rob and steal or they, they call it looting? Why would you do all that if you want, um, why would you black people do all that if you want people to respect your lives, if you want people to understand and listen to you? That's not how you go about listening. Like rioting and looting is not how you go about getting change. And what she says is, and I think it's, like I said, almost a piggyback off of that uh, Dr. King quote, the riot is the language of the unheard. It's the frustration. It's the feeling of hopelessness. It's the feeling of oppression, where to the point sometimes it is not even viewed as your own property. It's not even viewed as something that, that is yours. A lot of people don't have ownership in those neighborhoods. So a lot of people can't go in and, and get loans for bank to even own things in those neighborhoods. And so to them, it's like, you try to do it the right way. You try to go out and try to work hard. You try to raise your children with manners and respect you try to do everything that you're supposed to do. You're trying to pull yourself up by these bootstraps that exist, but you have no boots to even pull yourself up. And so what do you do? And then you see the ones that you love still getting gunned down in the streets. Like this, this play is timeless. It transcends time. It doesn't matter if it's 2001 or 2021. These same things are still happening. And so I think that's what she means. Like, well, we've tried to do it your way. We've tried to do it the right way and it's still just to no avail. And so let's shake some things up. Maybe that will get you to hear us. Maybe now you will listen. Um, but sadly, there's been riots and looting for years as well, right? So um, how do we get voices that have been silence for so long truly to be heard. Um, 
And I don't have all the answers for that, but I think that's why we're having discussions like, like we are today, is to try to figure out how we can empathize with each other, how we can hear, how we can change hearts and minds, because you mentioned something about um, advocacy, policy, and laws. Laws change with people. Once people's heart change, once their outlook on different situations change, laws change. And so that is, that's what we need. We need to, to hit that core of em empathy and understanding and um, looking out for something other than just ourselves and what we, what we covet. Um, and so that's, that's what I think that she's trying to get at. Um, and then the next question was, what was the second? Remind me what the second piece. You know, what is shaking the walls? You know, if, if we are gonna shake the walls, what does that mean to you? What it means to me is, I think that for me, we, we've all got to get out of the, um, out, of, out of our own way. Uh, we have to be prepared to, to listen, to have difficult conversations that will make you angry, that will hurt, um, but willing to, to listen and willing to say, okay, well, what needs to change in order for these things to stop, stop happening? Everyone just talks, but no one's listening and no one's putting forth action. To shake it up, you gotta, you gotta do different things. For example, um, in, in corporate America, there's always these diversity and inclusion. How can we get more diverse talent? How can, how can we do this? Well, you know, let me tell you how you, you can do it. If you get out of your head about all the dollars, the bottom line and just money, maybe you could have you know, more diverse talent. It's the same thing with you know, corporations hiring uh, law firms that support diverse lawyers in their firms. And to say, we're gonna hold our dollars and not hire your firm if you don't have diverse talent, I mean, that, that puts a fire up under someone, right? And those are, that's shaking the walls to me. When you get out there and you do that, that, that shakes the walls. But it just, we have so many, hurdles in our way where we're not, we don't have the courage and the fortitude to do that. Um, and so that's just one example that's in my real life as, as a lawyer, that's something I see that, that comes up. I think it's about really putting forth action and enforcing it, forcing, forcing the way with, and realizing that there's going to be some tough moments in getting there, but that's how we get change. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I and I I'm happy to see I'm happy to see that uh, Ahmed uh, that you that you could join the call. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll just pause for for two seconds to uh, to give you the floor, do a do a brief introduction, and then maybe just spend a, a few moments sharing kind of your general reaction to the play. Certainly, feel free to to respond also to to the thoughts and and insight that that Ashley just shared as well. So thank you, Julian, for uh, hosting and facilitating this conversation. Ashley, it's good to see you. It's been much too long. Um, it's, it's, it's been great listening to the conversation thus far, and I apologize for running behind because in all actuality, it's a representation of the type of work that needs to be done. I was at the State House this evening, and uh, we had to testify on a bill concerning school funding. And for the last several years, school funding has been going more towards a more equal funding instead of a more equitable funding framework where you have this foundational amount of money where that everyone gets the same dollar amount. But then they have this other dynamic where there's called complexity dollars for more impoverished schools, uh, students that have special needs and English language learners. And that dollar amount has been going down steadily for the last several years, which is creating a larger chasm between the halves and the have nots. And in order to shake those walls at the state house, uh, you, have to, you have to erode the foundation of sorts. And uh, that's what we've been striving to do over the last several years and that work continues today. In my role as general counsel and chief of external affairs at Indianapolis Public Schools, I not only oversee the, uh, all the legal work for the district and mitigate risk, I also work really closely with elected officials in trying to create a more equitable uh, policy framework for uh, success for IPS students. And in all actuality, uh, I look at it as through the lens of all students because if we're able to create a policy landscape that's fair for IPS students, the largest school, school district in the state of Indiana, 
that optimizes the chance and enhances the chances of more students uh, having access to rigorous curriculum, extraordinarily uh, uh, brilliant students who are in need of access to all these other services and supports. Uh, if we can do that for IPS students, I firmly believe we can do that for uh, other students and have that larger impact. Um, I thought a lot about this play. I was recently writing about uh, the legacy that Black attorneys have uh, have to a acknowledge and live up and b live up to. Uh, I was writing about the life of Vernon Jordan, uh, who recently passed, and how he was a continuation of not only the legacy that was set at Howard University uh, School of Law, but was in place even before him. So it starts with Charles Hamilton Houston, and then of course you have Thurgood Marshall, and you have all these brilliant scholars that were there at Howard University School of Law. And what do they do? They combated injustice. They, were, they turned into activists, some in the courtroom, some right on the streets, some going straight down to uh, farms and registering voters. Uh, that's how we ultimately shake up that foundation. And once you shake up that foundation, that's when we're able to move those walls to create real longstanding change. And um, uh, Ashley, you, you hit the nail on the head, particularly about the piece of so-called rioting and looting. Um, if you don't have this sense of ownership, you're not destroying your property. Uh, you, you don't feel connected to those items. Uh, you're connected to the people. And that's the human piece that we often don't talk about in those times of uh, civil unrest. It's the human element that really drives those narratives and draws attention to many of those critical issues that we need to be talking about and then moving towards action on as well. So thank you for having me and looking forward to more of the conversation. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, and so, you know, on this on this first question, last but not least, Ryan, um, you know, happy to have you chime in and um, kind of share any thoughts or reactions to what's been shared so far. Sure. I think uh, what Ahmed alluded to um, was that the walls don't have to be shaken on a grand scale. Um, it can be people just sharing their story, sharing their experience and deviating from the norm, which seems to be, you know, people not doing so. Um, and I think recently you've seen an increase of that. People have felt more comfortable coming forward. And I know uh, at my high school, actually, there was uh, a protest, if you will, it was a small gathering of, of people where they had a number of high school students just share their experience and talk about what it was like to be black at a school that was majority white. And, you know, talk about, how their identity has shifted over the years. Um, some people talked about the fact that they didn't feel comfortable. They didn't feel um, like they could be themselves. And, you know, just that whole evolution of growing into themselves. I, I think people need to hear that because it's something that happens silently, right? We all want to fit in. So I think, you know, shaking the walls can just be as much as sharing your experience. Um, I think one thing that uh, I find interesting is, you know, they say we ain't been heard yet is, is what the quote said. Uh, people always want to bring up Dr. Martin Luther King and quote him. They shot that guy. You know, he was assassinated. And so when people say, oh, why do you have to riot? Why do you have to you know, do this and, and do things the wrong way? We've tried to do things the right way. There have been a number of people, um, the Black Panthers, you know, have tried to do things the right way. Um, and so I think when you're met with so much resistance over time, you start to get frustrated, you start to act out a little bit. And I mean, we can see that when you look at uh, little kids, and that's not to infantilize, uh, you know, that experience, or, you know, compare those experiences in that way. But it's more of a comment on human behavior in general. If you don't pay attention to even a small child, eventually, they start acting out, they get on the ground, they start rolling around, they start yelling. And what are we but, you know, children who have lived a little bit longer, you know? So uh, I, I think once we realize that, it will allow us to connect with each other a little bit better. And I think that's, you know, what it will really take. Absolutely. You know, I think also um, interesting, we're, I've, I've heard a few references now to like kind of doing it the right way, right? Um, but that, that also kind of, begs the question, so to speak, of, well, what is the right way? And particularly in light of who defines what is right? Um, because 
my recollection um, of our countries, of our nation's history, was we didn't like being colonies, right? Um, we grew tired of British, the crown's oppression, right? Uh, and we decided, you know, collectively, apparently, right? But there was a decision made that we're not going to take this. And so there was a revolution, right? And so, you know, in certain historical contexts, um, the, the idea of revolution is looked at patriotically. Um, and, you know, we quote all the brilliant language from Thomas Jefferson, um, you know, in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then there's a different, there's a very different context that is sort of superimposed or imposed in general um, when any sort of discussions of changing the way that um, our, our demographics are treated, um, if it's anything other than sort of a uh, Martin Luther King, what, what is generally associated with a Martin Luther King narrative, um, that is seen as sort of militant or radical, um, right? And so it's, it, 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 but, but if it's, but if the context is in this historical patriotic sense, then violence is seen as, you know, every man's right, uh, you know, using the parlance of the time, but every man's right uh, to sort of actually throw off the government that is oppressing him and his, you know, and, and, and his interests. And so um, it is, it is an interesting, um, it is an interesting dialectic, a, a juxtaposition. Um, and, and so th those are all very interesting thoughts. And again, in terms of how do we shake the walls and and what happens when we shake the walls? Um, and what do we want to see happen when that when, when we when we make those decisions? And so that kind of segues into another portion of the conversation, which and 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 kind of again um, harkens back to to part of the thematics of of this conversation, which is you know from a, if we're looking at policy making, policy setting, law making, um, you know. What what can we do? What type of policy should be in place? Uh, where do the conversations lead, right? And so, you know, one one thing that we can that we should consider, and maybe Ahmed, I'll start with you on this, is when we are advocating for policy change, um, how do you approach having difficult conversations within your organization? And you know, so. And then how do we move beyond the conversation, right? So, so we, all, we know that it's difficult to have these conversations. How do you do that? And then once you have those conversations, how do you move beyond that? It's a lot to unpack. And in all actuality, I want to go back to what you were transitioning from in the closing part of the previous question. And for me, it all goes back to power. Uh, policy and power and access are all interconnected. And those in power, whether you're an elected official or a autocrat or a dictator, you wanna maintain that power, whether you're in an industrialized country and you're, or you're a, a lesser developed country, the, the more industrialized country wants to maintain their hegemony in the world. That's the ultimate goal, the maintenance of that structure that put them in power. So you're less likely to welcome those that are trying to disrupt the status quo, whether it's uh, during reconstruction and you have this large number of black elected officials post civil war that gained some power. What did the power structure do? They changed the game to get rid of those that ac gained access to that power to get them out of power and maintain that Southern block of power. So how do we, A, get power and, and, and spread out power in a really thoughtful way. And those that are currently, and I'm using that word a lot, those that are in this position of influence, how do we have conversations with them and not only have conversations, but build true relationships? Um, we have folks that are elected officials that aren't leaders. We have leaders that are not elected officials. And we need to make sure that we try our best to distinguish between the two and hold elected officials um, accountable 
And at the same time, think about how do we elevate those leaders to make sure that they have uh, not only more power and influence, but are truly representing the interests of those, of those people that they represent. Uh, I think the most important lever of power is at the local level. We spend a lot of time focusing on federal policy and federal elections. Um, during the last four years, the presidency sucked the air out of every single conversation. We couldn't talk about local policy or local issues without talking about pre former President Trump. We couldn't talk about anything in politics without talking about uh, 1600 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. That's not a healthy uh, democracy. You have this federalist system within the United States where you have this federal government, then you have state and local governments and they need to be balanced. And that balance is completely off, off skew right now. So how do we A, approach our local elected officials to create a healthy policy environment, whether it's on homelessness, whether it's on education, whether it's on criminal justice and all these other issues, A, we have to hold them accountable. B, we have to be thoughtful about how we hold them accountable. C, we also have to be really thoughtful about the policies that we push forward to in order, in order to have an impact on our families and our day-to-day -day lives. Um, for me, it's power and relationships. How do we uh, hold power accountable and how we build strong relationships that are not just transactional, nor are they one-dimensional relationships? No, that's, um, and that's, uh, you know, th like you said, there's a lot, there is a lot to unpack there, but, uh, but appreciate that sort of illuminating, you know, insight and, and context. Um, yeah, there's, there's just, there's so much there. Um, and, and I think we're going to, I think what ultimately what we're saying is there's going to be some additional, you know, follow-up and, and action that, that needs to continue. Um, you know, Ryan, maybe we'll, we'll kick it over to you um, just to kind of follow up um, in terms of, um, you know, similar, similar thing, you know, Ahmed shared his, his perspective in terms of, you know, power and relationships. What, what, what do you prioritize um, in terms of, um, you know, similar conversations and then again, building the, the right types of policy. For sure. Uh, I think for me, it's important to start with heart. And I know that that's a you know, touchy feely approach to some people, but I think deep down, even the most, uh, you know, cold and stern of us have these motivations, you know, and these uh, things that we want, these things that make us feel self actualized. And I think even when you're opposed to someone uh, from a uh, you know, philosophy standpoint, if you will, it's important to understand why they feel the way they do. And often we want to lead with our own story, but I think you gain some power when you can understand where the other person's coming from and then relate your story to them. And I think that's a hard thing for people to do. Uh, I, I think it's definitely tough given uh, you know, historical context in a lot of situations. But I think on a, a small level, it, it's very important because people won't listen to you if they don't feel like you understand them. And people get frustrated when they feel like you don't understand them. That's what we talked about a little bit before. So I think starting with heart and understanding where people are coming from, um, I think even a little more granular set and setting are important. Uh, people are a little more receptive uh, in more private venues rather than public. So if you have an issue with someone or you want to bring up something, uh, it's important to realize that they may not uh, hear you out if they feel threatened by, you know, the forum in which you're bringing it up. So I think it's always important for me when I'm trying to advocate for change that, you know, I build consensus with people outside of these large public meetings. You talk to people individually, you see who the most difficult people are, and you try to get them on your side in any way you can or at least the majority of people. So I think uh, that was kind of a, a little bit more granular of an answer than uh, Ahmed gave, but uh, that's generally where I like to start when it comes to advocating for change. No, that's um, also, it's, and again, it just, I think, I think it shows how complex and multifaceted and, and complicated, you know, these things are. Um, and it, and it really gets, yeah, you know, it's. I think it is one of those situations where, for better or for worse, I think it's almost better to set the strategy at the outset, 
Um, because I think what happens so often is, you know, we kind of say, this is what we want, but, but we don't so much articulate and that, you know, sort of formulate how we want to get there. And so what ends up happening, you know, nothing is linear, even the best set strategy isn't linear, but what ends up happening is more reactionary, um, you know, a series of small reactionary uh, occurrences instead of, you know, more um, just, it's almost like the, the steam, the steam train starts rolling and it can't stop because you, that is the course that you have set. Um, it also gets into concepts, you know, we, we talk about public versus private settings, um, which to me uh, brings uh, notions of, you know, of reparations. I'm not sure if folks saw uh, that I, I was reading a couple different news sources. It looks like Evanston, Illinois is going to be one of the first, if not the first U.S. city to implement essentially a reparations program um, for, for its citizens, um, which is, which is really an interesting development, but that sort of calls up for me, even broader notions of, of reparations, right? Certainly monetary payment is what comes to mind, I think kind of just intuitively, but there's also notions of apology and forgiveness. Um, you know, you can look at, obviously we have the 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 context of you know indigenous populations being essentially you know genocide on indigenous populations and then sort of stuck into the you know undesirable areas of the country you've got slavery you've got the failure of reconstruction followed by jim crow uh and then you kind of have you know everything sort of flowing from there insidiously but there are also uh international examples for example the holocaust uh, Yugoslavian genocide, Rwandan genocide, um, several examples where there have been additional atrocities, that, you know, and, and I think no need to even try to do an apples to apples comparison, but an, an atrocity nonetheless, where groups of people, uh, you know, South African apartheid, like groups of people found ways to um, hold the the actors accountable to implement some sort of apology and in some cases even return or you know like disgorge some sort of profit and return that that value to the to the group of people that were harmed and so um, it just it again when we're talking about sort of public versus private it's really interesting to see you know, well, of course, like someone who's done something wrong is going to not want to necessarily have that, you know, sort of thrown in their face publicly. Um, and so what is that process, right, for building consensus, which I which I do believe in, versus eventually uh, demanding, requiring some sort of public recognition and apology and then action to, to you know, to say this, we're, now we've said that we're sorry, now we're going to show you. Um, that we're sorry. Um, very interesting, very interesting concepts. But um, before we go further, I, I do want to also actually um, open it back up for you to, um, you know, again, if you'd like to chime in with respect to this policy discussion that we're having, um, you know, we've heard both the kind of, you know, start with the heart, um, the, 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 there is a more intimate side, interpersonal side, but then also, you know, power and perspective, um, and anything that you'd like to add to those to those viewpoints? Yeah, sure. And you know, it's like you said this earlier. Like, get my mind, Julian. Like, you're we're on the same wavelength here. When you made the the comment about clearly defining what it is that we want, and so I kind of take it from perspective of um, how we can change like workplace dynamics, and because we spend so much time at work. And I know personally, I have experienced a lot of racial hostility and um, subconscious uh, racial bias. And how how can we, you know, eliminate that or get you know other people to understand that? And so what you see is, like you said, a lot of reactionary things, especially 2020. I've seen more than I've ever seen in my professional career, and then it fizzles out. 
right? You have these, you get invited to these calls. You are engaged with your, you know, superiors and other colleagues. And it seems that it's going very well. It's like, oh, someone's listening to me, right? But then, it, like I said, it fizzles out. So how can we stop it? How can we continue to advocate for the change that we need? And I think sometimes it almost has to be done like how you would do like an organizational management style of change where you have to think of it like, okay, clearly define what it is that you want. Develop some type of plan that you can help to execute it. Find a way to measure it. Business people love to measure everything, right? So figure out a way to, to measure it. Make sure that you have people on your committees or in your advocacy groups that don't look like you, don't have anything in common with you whatsoever just literally, like sometimes you can look someone just dead in the face and realize this person's probably not like me, right? Pick, pick all those guys and, and, and women and get them on board and have different perspectives, you know, from the highest of the high to, you know, the entry level um, college student that, you know, may be answering the phones, first, first gig out of college. You need those different perspectives because all of our experience are different. The way I've dealt with social injustice is very different than you know, my 75 year old grandma. Our, our experiences, while they may be relatable, they are different. And you know, how we respond to those, um, because even with generations, you know, just the response and how we deal with things are so different. I think that's very important. And then I think we should make sure that we leverage those relationships and, and keep them going and then hold folks accountable. And I, I think that that is very much, it sounds rigid almost, um, but I think that's kind of what you have to have in play. And like Ryan said, I think when you put all that together, you'll end up getting your heart element. I think eventually it, it, it will come out. Um, but maybe you got to go about it a little bit more like step by step accountability. How can we measure this? And did we meet our goals? Do we make sure that we are helping those that are impacted? Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. I, I will just briefly mention, you mentioned reparations, and I did not know about the Evanston, Illinois, so I can't wait to learn more about that. And I see that uh, posted it in our chat, so I will be checking out. And I agree with you. It's just like in our personal relationships. If someone keeps harming you and they keep saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's like your words mean absolutely nothing at this point. Like, what have you shown me? that you've changed? What are you doing? Your actions speak so much louder than your words eventually. And so I think that that is very thought provoking. And I think a lot of times people view it as, oh, you're just trying to get some money. You know, you just want like a little extra on your paycheck or, but I, I don't think that that's necessarily how I view it. I almost view like reparations could be in the form of access and opportunity because so many people, it's not just, you know, they don't have a lack of money is that they don't have a, they have a lack of resources. They have a lack of just seeing that there's something else out there and being positioned to truly take advantage of those opportunities and that access. Um, and so that is what I would like to see for minorities, especially African-Americans that have just been extremely disadvantaged uh, through oppression and systematic injustices all over. So that's just my, my, my two cents there. Hey, Julian, I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick. Uh, just two points. Uh, Ryan hit on the, the, the heart piece, and I don't want to minimize that. In all actuality, I, I think it, it starts with the heart. Uh, one of my favorite Cornell West Coates quotes uh, is, uh, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people. If you don't, you can't save the people if you don't serve the people. And it starts with that love for the people. And uh, that, that's no matter if you're uh, at the local, federal, state, international level, the true grassroots level, you have to love the people in order to do that work, that kind of work that is bringing true change to people's lives. And then the second piece is on the reparations. Uh, in every example that you cited, whether it was from Yugoslavia to South Africa, to even uh, right here in the United States with the Japanese internments, who received reparation, by the way, um, by a federal act, by the federal government. But they started with a true acknowledgement of the hurt, the pain, and the devastation of those actors. And then you had the reconciliation. Then you had the reparations. It has to start with truth. 
And just like service has to start with love. I want to jump in quickly as well. Uh, My apologies, Julian. Uh, I think that's a great point. I always like to remind people that reparations are not unprecedented and not unprecedented in America. But, uh, you know, kind of what both were, you know, Ahmed and uh, Asi were saying, uh, you know, when it comes to these small things, I think it starts with us as individuals. And it's hard to like do that work. But one of the favorite quotes that was said to me, uh, I was actually complaining about one of my jobs is very rigid. And uh, I was talking to my mentor and I was like, I'm an HR. Why do I have to wear steel toe shoes? Why do I have to wear a uniform? Why do I have to be here at the exact time every day? And he just paused and he said, you are the culture. And I was like, ah, okay. You know, I am the culture. So these small interactions that I have on a daily basis, when I talk to my friends, when I'm in the group chat and people say something inappropriate or, you know, some joke that might be, you know, a little off color, I need to correct that because it's these small things that add up and, you know, grow into larger things. I mean, we're a collection of cells as a human being. Cells make organs, organs make body systems, body systems make people, you know, small acts evolve and they become larger, giving the person that one little opportunity to shine at work. So, hey, maybe I'll look outside of the normal scope of people that I look at. And you give that person that opportunity, you can change their life. And then they change two people's lives. And those two change four people's lives, you know? So that's just uh, what I wanted to add there. No, that's awesome. And I, I'm uh, so appreciative of the um, sort of proactive jumping in. It's exactly, it's exactly what I wanted to see and, and appreciate the the turn, you know, the positive turn that that, that um, conversation took. I, you know, I think that, uh, and I know we are kind of closing in about five or six minutes here left. Uh, and so want to give time for any parting thoughts. Um, what, what, I'll, what I'll maybe tee up for, for the last few minutes, um, I, you know, I've thought about concepts of, of abundance and I think about concepts of uh, scarcity, competition, um, and just kind of even existential uh, dynamics that are, that are facing um, the planet, right? The, the, the globe. Um, and so it's, there, there's, there are so many, interesting issues one of also ego right the concept of the ego um because for example i was um, introduced to some information recently um about um, blockchain technology right being used to uh really usher in a new era of carbon reduction greenhouse gas reduction efforts Right. And it's there's a white paper. I can send it to you. But the, the 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 core principle underlying this idea is is actually the opposite of competition. Right. It, it's that there, when there is something existential, for example, in approximately 15 years. Right. If you if you conceptualize a carbon budget for the planet, we are we are in in danger of spending our carbon budget in the next 15 years. Okay, that's that's like a blink of an eye. Right. And so with these sort of existential uh, threats, frankly, that are knocking at our doorstep, how do we prioritize? How do we triage the just immense things that are that were just kind of staring us in the face? And, you know, is there a way to sort of exponentially increase these ideas of equity? and abundance and cr- creating a, a, a system and, and, and relationships where we all recognize what we are bringing and we all recognize that we, there is an interrelated and connectivity that we need to progress uh, to, to survive in the, in the, at, at the very core. Um, and you know, how do we prioritize, for example, racial equity and inclusion and you know, you know, basically like the, I can't breathe my, you know, my hands are up. How do we stop these things while at the the same time facing an unprecedented existential threat in the form of right. Greenhouse gas emissions, uh, poor stewardship of the resources that we, that could be abundant. So it's a big question. 
but I, but I, I thought I'd, I thought I would throw that out there because unfortunately this isn't the only issue that we're dealing with. Um, and sorry, maybe I'll start with Ashley on this one. So I was writing down your question um, so I could think about it and see, you know, how do we prioritize racial equality and inclusion when it's over the backdrop of some other existential crisis that we're having? Yours was um, uh, basically our environment and what we entangled ourselves in from just treating our land, like you said, for stewardship. Um, I think also one that's very imminent is, is COVID. I think something else that's happened and that is over the backdrop of, of racial equality. Um, I think that it, racial equality must be prioritized because of the nature of what oppression and racism does to groups of people and what it does to those groups of people outlook on life and how it leads them to value themselves less. When you are in a minority that isn't um, even thought of to deserve full, full idea of a human, I, I think about three fifths um, of a person and how it could really feel to walk around knowing that you are not a person. I think of Dred Scott, right? Um, to someone to tell you that, and that you are just incredibly devalued. And what that, the toll that that has on generations that you keep building off of it. And to face these existential crises that we have, like we need people at their full selves. We need people that are, there's somebody out there right now, some black kid that maybe has all the answers, right? They don't have the access or opportunity because no one values them. And maybe if the roles were reversed, he would be able to go to school, go get a PhD, learn, be able to meet people in, in positions of power and leverage those relationships that we've been talking about. But because they're so downtrodden with no access and no value, they just never reach that potential. And so, you know, I think that's so important. There was a, just a lot of conversation even around COVID where, you know, you had um, African-American doctors that were in scientists that were involved. They were like young women. And I love to see that. And it's just like, wow, like, look at that. This is, this is access. This is opportunity. This is inclusion. This is what's needed. So you have this great talent that's here working to save lives or coming up with solutions to our problems. We must- that's Absolutely racial equality yeah uh, absolutely i think i think and i think we're i know we're at time but maybe just 30 seconds each um ahmed and then we'll close out with you ryan i love history and one of and i'm sure everyone on this call and those listening and, and watching have heard this before but i think that our country's first and original sin was slavery and we haven't come to fully grasp the extent of the psychological, emotional, and spiritual toll and economic toll that's taken on communities right here in the United States. We have to acknowledge it. We have to address it in a significant way. And we also have to acknowledge that we exist within a capitalist system. And when we're able to deal with these issues of racial uh, inequality and injustice, uh, we'll be able to truly uplift more. So when I say that me as a black man can do better, that's going to have a positive net impact on so many others. When we're able to address criminal justice, when we're able to address homelessness, when we're able to address all these issues that are affecting communities across our country and disproportionately more black and brown communities, we'll be able to truly lift more of us um, uh, at large. So I know we only had 30 seconds. So I try to compress my thoughts in that really large question, Julian. So appreciate it. I know that's not fair. It's not fair. But thank you, Ahmed. Ryan, you want to, you want to close us out? 
I'll compress mine as well. Uh, piggybacking off of that, I hope everyone looks up epigenetics. That's something that's very interesting. Um, but to the point of the question, uh, find your lane. Your lane doesn't have to be everything. Your lane can be, you know, a major cause that you fight for and, you know, that you go hard for. So find what that is. But also don't est underestimate the small th things. If you get 1% better each day, you get 37 times better over the course of a year. So those are uh, my two key takeaways. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I know that we've ran a little bit over time, um, but want to thank our panelists, Ashley, Ahmed, and Ryan. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks to Fagri Baker Daniels for hosting the series. Thanks to the IRT um, for just, you know, having the mission and, and the vision to help, you know, elevate the, um, our voices and, and these causes. Um, I will say really quickly that if you haven't actually seen the play or if you know folks that haven't seen the play, um, please go online today. Um, you can go to IRTlive.com uh, to purchase a ticket. Uh, and, and the play number six will be streaming through April 4th. Thank you so much for joining us.